All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We are looking at convolutional neural networks today. Um, and this is really an extension of everything that we've been seeing in fully connected neural networks. And now we're, we're heading into more details. All right. Last time, there was a question somebody had asked uh, on my thoughts on the paper that we had given you uh, to read uh, for the homework. Um, and the Sorry, there's a question, when does the leaderboard close? Uh, it closes uh, standard. Uh, the way we close the homeworks is typically that we keep, uh, we have a deadline and we keep it open for the late days uh, that anyone may submit it to after that. So the leaderboard will close uh, at the same point. Um, so deadline of the homework plus late days. Okay. So the my thoughts on uh, this paper that we give you to read um, are that they relate uh, pretty heavily to the things that um, we have been talking to you about in class. Um, so we've been telling you this notion of error decomposition and this idea that you know you decide a model class and right at the offset of onset of decision of that model class, you pay uh, something called the modeling error, um, and then you have uh, optimization and estimation errors within that model class, um, and one question to ask immediately then is why this model class why do we choose multi-class logistic regression or why resnet why alexnet what makes certain model classes better um, and in general this comes down to uh, this intuition with a formal instantiation in machine learning known as the Neaf no free lunch theorem which is that no particular model class is universally better for all kind of data sets uh, that you may have certain problems for which certain model classes are better. You may have certain other problems for which certain other model classes may be better. There is no universal, uh, universally optimal uh, model class in some sense. You can um, have universally uh, representative model classes that contain all possible functions, but they are not better in the sense that then you just have shoved your problem into estimation error. Um, what you can say is that if I know that my data is going to be images or my data is going to be speech signals or my data is going to be language so it's going to be word tokens can i come up with small concise model classes that maybe contain reality or can i come up with small model classes that are close to reality that have low modeling error but uh, are small uh, because so that searching within them is easy Right. So that's a question that is well posed. You can ask that question. Um, can I hope to get um, for my data set, for my task, for my problem, if I know something about my data, can I encode that into my model class? And the answer to that is yes, that in in some sense is what practitioners and um, and, and machine learning people are engaged in. Um, the reason why we're going to study CNNs today is because it is well suited. Those those types of architectures and those layers are well suited to handle, uh, you know, spatial data or images. Um, so with that in mind, um, I think the 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 way to think about uh, the experiments in in Guy, Guy and Ha uh, are to really think about inductive biases. There are certain model classes. Uh, where most of the heavy lifting is done by choosing that model class in the first place. Um, and that the parameter learning within that model class um, largely doesn't matter. They're not making that strong a claim. They're just saying, if I chose not to do strong parameter learning in this model class, if I chose to do just sort of expectation over uh, tied uh, weights uh, in this model class, how far can I get? And the fact that I can get far is surprising. And that really is a claim about that this. Uh, model is, is appears to be have some inductive bias. Some uh, this is the, this term inductive bias um, is a term that is used to refer to the fact that I have a model class that has low approximation error with respect to the task that I'm trying to solve. And there's a really nice timing of this with respect to CNNs that we're going to study. And if you want to understand this better, uh, look at uh, the question four in homework two. Um, what we ask you to prove in that question is that. Circular convolutions have a specific property, um, and they are the only operation with that property. And that property is shift equivariance. That is, uh, if you shift the input, the output is shifted by exactly that amount, and that uh, that it doesn't really matter whether you shift first and then apply uh, circular convolutions or the other way around. Um, and 
you know, that intuition, that formal intuition that, you know, okay, circular convolutions are a way to achieve that. If you know your data is such that shift equivariance is a good thing, that no matter what models you develop should learn shift equivariance because images have that property. I can move things around within an image and why should you care whether I framed my object in the center or I framed it off to the right or to the left. Your representation should be in, uh, invariant or equivariant precise, more precisely to that. If you know that about your data, then that question tells you something that, uh, you know, this is the kind of uh, layers in your neural network that should be present because they encode that property by design. Um, and so really this paper uh, is a nice connection to uh, the notion of inductive biases. The other notion is that you should start thinking of, as we've told you many times, architectural elements as Lego blocks that are put together, but really it's the search for right Lego blocks. All Lego blocks are not equal. Some Lego blocks encode certain, uh, certain priors or biases, inductive biases about your data. Uh, and this will become uh, more clearer. We will have a guest lecture on neural architecture search in this class where we will tell you algorithms that do search for architecture. So most of the uh, most of the semester we'll be using expert intuition, um, you know, machine learning uh, researchers, mine, everybody else's to tell you why certain architectures are better than others. And then we'll say, you know, hey, what do we know? Maybe uh, there's a way to search for architectures that uh, that can be automated. Um, the last thing that is the thought that should be mentioned is that there is a discussion to be had on how much should be learned versus how much is innate. Um, this discussion has a particular problem is that it very quickly gets trapped into the way of thinking of how biological intelligence operates. Um, and therefore that must be the mode of operation for artificial intelligence as well. And that is a leap that at least I find struggle to make. Um, that just because, you know, this is how it's done, that we find, we come across a lot of um, species in, in biological uh, intelligence in, in, the, in, in the real world that appear to exhibit a lot of innate behavior, that they have that those capacities at birth does not mean that that is how it should be done or that is the only way uh, it can be done uh, in AI. Um, that is a, a leap that I struggle to make. Uh, and therefore I find this particular framing, learned versus innateness debates to be largely not very useful. They, they don't move the conversation forward, uh, but you should be aware that that is a point of discussion. Um, and I, I fully admit this is a personal preference. This is how I approach this debate. You are welcome to form your own on my own. Okay. Let me take a look at questions. Will we cover backprop in FC layers today? I think it was mentioned in the last lecture. Yes, we will cover that. We will look at that in the next few slides. Okay, we are moving to convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks are really the building blocks um, and the de facto models for dealing with visual data, images, videos, um, We've started seeing convolutional type networks for uh, some sort of speech signals as well. But anytime your signal has some sort of spatial arrangement, um, you see convolution uh, neural networks pop up. So that's going to be our uh, our plan for today, uh, especially what is a convolution and what are FC, what is the connection between FC and conv layers. Um, so let's remember, um, so just sort of backing up, Convolutional neural networks are a different model class. They are not a new learning algorithm. They're not a new optimization algorithm. They're a different model class. And so therefore, the, the, what you compare them to are linear classifiers. In linear classifiers, we said we would take an image, we would string it up into a long column vector, we would multiply it by a matrix, add a bias, and that's what gave us scores. Um, and we sort of visually illustrated this as well, that you take these four numbers, you string it up into a column, uh, these are the, the weight values and you get scores. Now let's, uh, and we also said, you know, you can uh, stack these things up, you don't have to have a single linear layer, you, as soon as you start adding non-linearities in between, you can have multiple linear layers um, and you can get multi-layer perceptrons or fully connected neural network, right? So far, so good. Now let's actually try to do this on large scale images um, and that will become immediately clear why we need convolutional neural networks and again this is without any 
uh, of the brain stuff, which is uh, making calls to uh, whether or not the brain implements convolutions or not. We really don't care. Um, it's it's a very elegant mathematical operation. It is not a model for the human brain, as far as I'm concerned. So here's a particular uh, uh, way of uh, thinking about it. Uh, here's I, I come to you and I say, OK, I have this image in uh, your homework assignment. You've been dealing with CIFAR. Those are small 32 by 32. You know, the high resolution images of those are, aren't uh, aren't uh, aren't uh, too high as well. But let's say I come to you and I say now I have 200 by 200 image. So this is my X. Um, this is a, a 200 by 200 image and maybe you sort of string it up into a long vector, right? So at 200 by 200, it becomes 4 into 10 to the power 4, 40k uh, pixels in this long vector. And I say, let's convert it to an H which is of the same size. So the H also has 4 into uh, 10 to the 4 uh, neurons, right? So here are the pixels being shown and here are the, so this is X and this is the H neurons being being shown. Uh, so my first question to you is, what is the number of parameters in this FC layer? Do people want to type that out? We have X which has 40K pixels and H which has 40K uh, hidden units or neurons as well. How many parameters are in this FC layer? One point six billion. Sixteen into ten to the eight. Yep. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, you uh, you will form a matrix which is output dimensions by input dimensions, and you will end up with um, sixteen uh, into ten to the eight because that's um, each of them is forty k times. 40k. That's how many you'll end up with, which is roughly uh, one point, which is exactly 1.6 billion or close to 2 uh, billion. Yes, uh, a bunch of you are answering uh, exactly the same thing. Yes, so you're going to end up with 1.6 billion or 2 billion parameters, and that's just in the first layer. In the first layer, uh, and that's not even counting the biases, right? Because there's going to be some constant biases or whatever. Like there's plus one, sure. Um, and uh, you're going to end up with uh, with nearly two billion uh, parameters in the first layer, and then maybe there's going to be f uh, more layers in this neural network if you're trying to make this deep. So this approach hopefully tells you that this does not scale. 200 by 200 size images are not big images. Uh, the cameras um, that that you are uh, now okay saying plus biases. Yes, you're right. Uh, I I missed the plus. Uh, biases, I think. Um, the 200 by 200 images are, are tiny images, um, and the cameras that are sitting in your on your cell phones, uh, they are uh, calculating. They are, they are uh, taking you know 10 megapixel images, um, and that that means that you know they're uh, you know 10 million pixels in the in the input X uh, is is what they're capturing. So this does not scale. Um, yet somehow most of the models that operate on images are able to deal with those images. So how do how do we do this? Um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to make two assumptions. Uh, those two assumptions are going to naturally lead to a, a mathematical operation called convolution. So let's let's meet those two assumptions and see if they seem reasonable. The first assumption that we're going to make is of local connectivity or locally connected layers. So just like they're fully connected layers, they are locally connected layers. Fully connected layers um, have H, L, I connected to everything. So this is a neuron. Instead of connecting it to everything, we will connect, we will connect it locally. Fully connected, locally connected. Maybe we choose a 10 by 10 neighborhood or a patch. And that's all that we connect uh, these things to. So this is Patch number one, this is patch number two, there are multiple patches, uh, this is HLJ, and so on. So there is a spatial connectivity neighborhood that we're going to uh, apply this connectivity to. As soon as we do that, even if we don't make any changes to the image size or the number of hidden units, if just the connection size or the connectivity size is some 10 by 10, you have already reduced the number of parameters to 40k times 100. That's the number of, there's one scalar on each of these edges. 
So you have already reduced the number of parameters from roughly two billion to uh, four million. Okay, so this was assumption number one that uh, let's make our neurons, our layers locally connected instead of fully connected. Uh, the other assumption that we will make is called stationarity or it is an assumption of parameter sharing. And that assumption is that this is HLI, this is HLJ, these are weights WI, these are weights WJ to the jth neuron. Stationarity says that statistics of the input are similar at all location, meaning that just because you happen to be looking at the top left patch versus the center top patch versus the center bottom patch, the image could have been uh, translated up, down, left, right. So why should your weights change? Your the, the data, the input will change, but whatever, if we think of these, these neurons as looking or, or, you know, the same intuition that we did in linear classifiers, that they are actually filters, that they're looking for uh, certain templates. Uh, if that is the case, then why should what you are looking for change uh, at different parts of the image? Uh, now, there may be certain situations where it where you want to look for the sky at the top and the ground at the bottom um, and your your images have certain structure. But if your images, if your data does not have that structure, you're, if you're willing to assume stationarity, then you can assume that WI is equal to WJ for all I comma J. That all of these uh, these these things are actually do uh, uh, the parameters are coupled. There is one set of parameters, right? Um, and as soon as you make the second assumption, um, we actually have massive uh, reduction uh, in the number of parameters uh, because uh, what you end up with is that there are let's say 40k neurons, um, but uh, uh, there are 40k neurons, but it really doesn't matter how many neurons there are. Uh, there is just one set of weights. So there's really just 100 times 100 equals 100 parameters. Uh, sorry, 10 times 10 equals 100 parameters that now uh, are, exist here. So we've really reduced from 2 billion to 4 million to 100 parameters. So there's been a very sharp reduction in the number of parameters based on those two assumptions that we've made, local connectivity and stationarity uh, slash parameter sharing. Okay, so there is local connectivity and there's stationarity. If we can assume those, we have massive reduction in the uh, number of uh, parameters. Can you briefly explain why we're allowed to share parameters? Um, so I'm actually not saying uh, why you're allowed to share um, or how is stationarity reasonable. Um, so there's a question, how is stationarity reasonable? We expect most images to change significantly based on location. Yes, the input X changes based on location, but do you expect if I'm looking, if these uh, if these neurons are looking for, let's say, a face detector or a nose detector or a person detector, do you expect the template of what a person looks like to change if the person is at the top of the image or at the bottom of the image? And that answer is is no. You could argue that if I'm looking for a patch, and when I say I'm looking for a patch, I mean if I'm looking for, let's say, a circle, uh, then circle stays the same regardless of whether it's at the top of the image or the bottom. I'm not saying the input is identical. I'm saying what I'm looking for is identical. Does this assumption actually hold? It seems like the variance of images is very high in places like the green segment versus the red segment. Um, the variance of the of the image uh, is high in the green segment versus the lower uh, red segment. So it depends on your data set, of course. Um, you are making an assumption that this holds uh, in practice. Uh, the way to test whether your hypothesis is true is to train a model without this assumption and to train a model with this assumption and see whether you get better generalization. Um, we can, of course, take patches, crop them out of images, uh, compute means, compute variances. Um, and what you're saying may actually be true, that it may not be that we have perfect stationarity, that the variances uh, are actually different. And so we do not have identical statistics of those two patches. However, all it has to be is close enough that this assumption 
uh, that the reduction in parameters in the computation is worth it, right? Um, and you know, the world is not linear either, yet we fit linear model, models to the world all the time. Um, and the answer is you just have to, uh, you're, you're, it's an approximation, but, the, but is, is it a good enough approximation? Is it an actionable approximation? Are we turning one image into multiple data points? Uh, not quite. No, we're not. Okay. So this right here, these two assumptions are what gives rise to a convolution or a convolutional layer, which we'll talk about, um, which means that you actually have uh, X as an input. H is now a feed, is, is a, is a two dimensional output as well. It can be reshaped, but there is only one setting of parameters W, uh, and that setting of parameters is, uh, the same setting at all these locations. And this, uh, is also in, known as a, a, a kernel or a filter, uh, and this notation will be familiar to people from, from signal, uh, processing. Um, Let's meet convolutions. Um, these are the, the operations that just pop out as a consequence of the two assumptions that we've made, uh, local connectivity and uh, parameter sharing. And we're going to read, really meet convolutions from three perspectives. We're going to meet uh, convolutions from the perspective of you know pure math or what you might consider signal processing, how those folks think about convolutions to how CS and computer scientists uh, people think about convolutions, um, to let's say how uh, uh, programmers think about convolutions. So convolutions in, in, in math, CS and programming, and it's going to be an integer, in, interesting journey. Um, I personally find, so I have a, an ECE undergrad background. Um, and so when I first arrived at convolutions, it was from a continuous time series signals perspective. Uh, and turns out that the deep learning perspective on convolutions, even though we end up using the same words, is very different. Um, and so this will be a, a useful journey. Um, so let's think about convolutions. Uh, if you are an electrical engineer or a math uh, person, uh, and you may have seen convolutions of continuous time signals. Uh, there is a signal XT, uh, there is a filter WT, there is a output signal YT. These are continuous time signals, uh, meaning that the X axis is continuous. Uh, maybe there is some uh, signal XT, which is E to the negative of T minus T naught squared uh, by two sigma squared. This is a Gaussian uh, signal. Um, it, this is not a PDF function. It does not have to integrate to one. Of course, if you add in the right normalizers, it can integrate to one. But that's not the point. Um, and we define continuous time convolutions uh, with this notation, X convolved with W. Uh, this is the convolution notation uh, of star. Uh, this as a function of time. We define this as uh, X of T minus A, W, A, D, A. This is the integral of over the entire uh, uh, real uh, uh, line uh, of a filter WA um, uh, being multiplied by XT minus A and the product being integrated over. Um, you may remember from your convolution lectures, from your early sort of undergrad uh, education, that convolutions are actually commutative operators, that X convolved with W is the same with, as W convolved with X. Um, and that's, you know, easy to prove uh, because you can show that this is just equal to X A W T minus A D A for the same integral uh, domain. Okay. Um, and if you, um, if you remember uh, back from your convolution uh, lectures that there was a way to think about this particular operation, like what are we doing with like the W T minus A, um, the way to the way to think about this operation uh, was to start. So let me just write this on. T is equal to negative infinity to infinity x t w x a w t minus a d a. The way to think about this was to uh, start off with let's say this was our w a. Uh, this is a particular uh, filter. Uh, that we can that we can write um, 
uh, it's not a box filter. It's just a, a, a filter that has a, a line on one side and a box on one side. So this is a particular uh, filter. Um, we can think of the operation of converting WA to W minus A as flipping about the Y axis. And so this becomes this sort of a, a filter. This is W of minus A function plotted as a function of A. And if the operation of converting W minus A to W of minus A minus T is translating shifting by T. And so you end up with a function that is now shifted at T uh, instead of the origin. And we end up drawing the same uh, filter. And this is still the A line. So if you want to compute YT, what you do is you place down the X uh, function, which was the Gaussian. Um, you uh, shift, you, you flip uh, W. Um, uh, you flip W um, and you shift your filter um, and this shifted uh, placement, uh, we do an element wise multiplication. Of course, the element wise multiplication does not exist for uh, infinite precision uh, or continuous time things, but you actually just compute the area under the product of these two functions. And that's what gives you this region. And this region is the computation of yt and that's what this integral is computing the repeated shifting um, uh, shifting being specified by t um, and yt being computed as this uh, i was smiling as i was writing this comment in chat uh, uh, yes yeah, i am aware that not everyone may have taken an undergraduate class uh, that covered convolutions uh, don't worry um, hang in there. The continuous time convolutions you will not see in deep learning, or at least not in the intro to deep learning. There will be continuous time convolutions if you want to do research in deep learning, uh, but in a couple of slides, it becomes simpler. It becomes so much simpler that you might actually ask me, why did you put me through all these integrals if uh, it was become so much, it was going to become so much simpler? Uh, and my answer is, yes, it becomes simpler, but you'll see where it's coming from. Okay. Um, what is W here? Uh, in these expressions, W is a, as far as continuous time filters are con uh, continuous time convolutions are concerned, uh, X is a signal, Y is a signal, W is a signal. Uh, the reason why I'm calling it W is to make an alignment to deep learning notation. In the next few slides, W will become the parameter of a convolutional layer, uh, which is the same as uh, the uh, sort of convolution kernel uh, we just talked about or the weight on the convolution layer that we just talked about. Um, so that's why I'm using that notation. Uh, but right now, uh, W is a continuous time signal. Um, okay, so this is uh, what convolutions are uh, as far as uh, electrical engineers or mathematicians are concerned, continuous time signals. Um, uh, and this is uh, uh, an illustration of what uh, convolutions operation looks like. So this is uh, not exactly the filter I chose. This is a box filter. That box filter is being moved around. Um, the blue line is, let's say, X. The red line is W. Uh, and of course, it will move around. It's a GIF. My arrow will only be accurate at one point in the GIF. Um, and what's happening is that each one of the placements of W uh, is corresponding to a particular setting of, of T. Um, and at that setting of T, uh, the, the red regions are the area of the overlap, uh, and the, the black curve is tracing uh, that area of overlap uh, as a function of T. Um, and so that's uh, the black curve is really uh, the YT that we're showing. Um, it's just uh, telling us that as you move this filter around and compute the area of the overlap uh, between these two filters, um, what is that function look like? Um, and so that's what's being plotted in the in the black uh, curve right here. Okay, so that's convolutions. Um, let's see, that's convolutions for continuous time signals. Um, and just like you can, uh, we wrote everything in, in one dimensions, but you can very, uh, oops, you can very easily, so yt, we wrote this as negative infinity to infinity, uh, x, t minus a, w, a, 
dA. If you want to write this in two dimensions, y just becomes a function of t1 and t2. Uh, instead of a single integral, it's a multidimensional integral. A goes from negative infinity to infinity. B goes from negative infinity to infinity. It becomes x of t1 minus a, t2 minus b, w of a comma b, dA db so it becomes a multi-dimensional integration problem um, with uh, you know a notion of time one time two which where really time is no longer the right thing this becomes uh, a notion of space uh, so di dimension one dimension two but really it's a, it's a simple generalization okay so that's how mathematicians or electrical engineers would think of it um, as soon as you come to computer scientists um, we are not very good with integration uh, computer scientists uh, don't take uh, too many calculus classes. Um, you know, integrations and integration scare us. We're okay with derivatives. Uh, that's the extent of calculus as far as computer scientists is concerned. Uh, right after that, it get, it becomes, uh, let's call it unnecessary. It becomes unnecessary, uh, needlessly, uh, needlessly painful. Uh, because as far as we're concerned, uh, there is no such thing as infinite precision. So there is no need for uh, these integrals. You can just convert them into summations, uh, and that works fine. Um, and so we will often talk about discrete time signals. Yt1, yt2 uh, is equal to summation uh, as opposed to integrals. Uh, we will have discrete time x t1 minus a, t2 minus b, w, a, b. And now our A's are going from negative infinity to infinity. B is going from negative infinity to infinity. Um, so there's no infinite precision. Uh, integrals can go away. Uh, and really, this is the product of those two signals again. And this is, again, computing area under the curve, except for discrete time signals as opposed to continuous time signals. And the second thing that computer scientists immediately uh, object to is that there is no infinite memory either. Um, so like none of this infinity stuff, uh, let's put actual bounds on these things. So let's assume that X is some two dimensional uh, uh, signal with uh, first dimension N1 and the second dimension N2. Uh, let me use cleaner notation. So this doesn't look like W, this is N2. Uh, this is still origin is the discrete time signal. Uh, w is uh, another uh, discrete time signal with k1 times k2. And now uh, it becomes uh, somewhat easier. Z A is uh, going from negative k1 minus 2 to positive k1 minus 1 by 2. Uh, and B is doing the same thing, negative genius becomes negative of k2 minus 1 over 2 to k2 minus 1 over 2 of exactly the same thing uh, that's written here. So no infinite precision, no infinite memory, discrete time signals, we get convolution uh, for, um, uh, for, uh, uh, for as far as discrete time signals or computer scientists are concerned. In CS, is there any significance to not flipping the kernel when convolving like you would in traditional convolution? Oh, just wait one slide. Yeah, we're about to, that's not CS, that's uh, not even programming, that's that's like deep learning. Uh, give me one slide, we'll get to that in a second. So this is X, this is W, uh, and this is Y of T1 comma T2 being computed um, at that particular location. Okay, so this is convolution for computer scientists. Um, and we will very quickly shift to convolution for programmers, um, which becomes, uh, which starts from this assumption that, look, uh, we are programmers. We do not like this, these negative numbers. So origin has to shift to the top left. Uh, if you can do that, uh, then things become a lot easier. All indices are, uh, iterators and indices become positive. We do not like these negative uh, iterators, uh, and that uh, gets uh, close to what is actually implemented. Um, so it becomes y of r comma c, because uh, now this refers to a row iterator and this refers to a column iterator, um, is equal to summation of x r 
uh, minus A, uh, C minus B, W, A, B. And this is A going from 0 to K1 minus 1, B going from 0 to K2 minus 1. So now it's uh, much clearer to what we actually implement. There is a, uh, there is a, a filter, or there is a signal X. The origin lies at the top left, 0, 0, which is what we like in programming. Everything starts from 0, 0. There is a smaller signal uh, or, a, or a matrix W uh, where origin lies again at the, at the top left. This is N1 times N2 sized. This is K1 by K2 sized. And now it becomes uh, pretty nice that if you want to produce an output, which is also uh, some size, if you, want, if you want an output being calculated at the row comma col column uh, value, here's the expression of how to do that, of how to produce it at row comma com column value. And the final thing, so this is almost what is implemented, but it's not exactly what is implemented. What is actually implemented is instead of this whole flipping of the input or flipping of the filters, uh, what we're actually just going to do is R plus A, C plus P. That's what is actually implemented. And the reason why that's implemented is that, look, this expression is, we're actually going to learn these filters, right? Um, w is a learned property. So if we're going to have to flip um, we neural networks might as well learn the flip filters if it's important. Um, and so this expression on the slide is actually what is implemented as convolutions. And as soon as I describe that, all the electrical engineers in the audience feel like crying uh, because they become aware that this is not actually uh, convolutions. Uh, this is a different operation. Um, so can people tell me what is this operation? It's not actually a convolution. It has a different name. Anybody remember what this operation is actually called? It is not a convolution. <laughs> oh, correlation. Uh, it's a good joke. It's a good joke. This is a cross correlation. That is correct. This is a cross correlation. Um, which tells you how frustrating naming conventions can be in deep learning that one of the primary objects, convolutional neural networks, are not even convolutional. They are cross-correlational neural networks because convolutional neural networks do not actually implement convolutions, they implement cross-correlations. Um, this is what's actually implemented. Um, there is a question, but why 0, 0, 0,0 won't work without padding? Uh, not true. Um, we'll talk about padding in a few slides, but this is not, not true uh, because we've convert, converted it into plus. Uh, think about what Y0,0 does. You don't require padding for Y0,0. What do you mean by flipping W and learning W? Aren't filters fixed? Um, w are parameters in a layer in neural network. We will learn W just like we learned the, the weights in a fully connected neural network. We will learn the weights in a convolutional neural network from data. Um, so no, they're not fixed. They're fixed at test time, but during training time, we compute gradients with respect to W and we learn W. Okay, so uh, that's what we're doing. This is a convolution as far as deep learning is concerned or a cross correlation. And that's what is composed of in order to form a convolutional neural network. So this is what a convolution looks like. This is X. This pixel right here is x 0 comma 0 this pixel this is y this pixel right here is y 0 comma 0 in order to compute y 0 comma 0 this red object is w um, and that the x has size 6 by 6 w has size 3 by 3 in order to compute y 0 comma 0 we place this red filter at this location, at the x0, 0 location. Why do we place it at x0, 0 location? Well, because that's what the expression says. 
R is zero and W and C is zero as well. So you just place it uh, at the zero comma zero location and then you enumerate over A and B uh, to do the multiplication and the summation. And that's what we are doing. We, in order to compute Y zero comma zero, we uh, place at X zero comma zero, uh, there is we do x zero comma zero times w zero comma zero plus uh, x sorry w zero comma one times x zero comma one and so on for all nine elements which is equal to three by three which is the k one by k two size of w so every element that overlaps between x and w gets multiplied you sum them together that value gets stored here in y 0 comma 0 when you have to compute uh, y 0 comma 1 you shift from x 0 comma 0 to x 0 comma 1 at this location you place down w um, and this is when you start multiplying the same thing um, you write down uh, x of uh, 0, uh, comma a, sorry, x 0, ah, I'm making errors. You write down x 0 plus a 1 plus b times w a comma b and you sum this over all a and b uh, in 0 to 2 um, and 0 to 2. And so this is the shift from uh, x. Why is this 0 and 1? Because we're asking for uh, y, the output 0, 1, and so on. If you want uh, y value uh, at 0, 2, you shift w over again, um, and so on. And you repeat it for every location and every placement of the filter, multiplication, uh, and storing the result uh, in y. Um, there's a nice little demo that uh, that explains this. I'll just pull that demo up uh, and we'll talk about more details of this demo uh, next time. Uh, let me pull this up in a second. And beep. then we can stop. Here uh, is a is a nice visualization of uh, of image kernels of of these kernels that we're talking about. Um, so this is a uh, a pixel. So on the on the right is an image. On the left is that image represent intensity image. We're not showing RGB. On the left is that same image represented as a matrix. Every pixel is an intensity value between zero and two fifty five. This you should be at this point familiar with. Um, we will uh, uh, apply a filter or a convolution. Um, so this is what that filter looks like. Um, so let's choose a different filter. Let's choose a blur filter. Um, actually yeah let's choose a blur filter uh, so it has these uh, three by three filter it has these values um, we will place that filter at particular locations uh, so notice that this demo allows us to place that filter such that parts of it are out of bounds we will talk about that uh, that is what uh, one of the questions talked about in terms of padding uh, but notice that when you place that filter at a particular location um, uh, and you uh, you look at the center value. What it's doing is taking the pixel, multiplying with those uh, weight values, uh, and that's being stored uh, in the output uh, on the right. Um, and so this is uh, you know shifted and and placed at all locations, uh, and that's where the output is uh, is is computed. So that's the expression uh, that we just uh, derived. Okay, so we are at time.